Coming up on Tech Thing, our power conditioners are waste to cast, three travel accessories you'll want in your bag, some cool advice on cabling, and quite a bit more, all coming up on Tech Thing. A big thank you to everybody that supports the show at patreon.com slash tech thing. Your contributions keep Tech Thing coming each and every week. Now that we've hit our latest milestone, we'll be bringing all our Patreons a special monthly build video. Thank you. I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm Patrick Norton. And this is Tech Thing. We make technology behave. At least on the good days. That was a pretty terrible version <laughs> of Kirk, wasn't it? I don't know if that was a terrible version of Kirk or Sam the Eagle from The Muppet Show, but there's a reason why I don't wear a blazer and she doesn't wear whatever people that... Star Trek uniforms? <laughs> wear what you gotta wear. I do have one, though. <laughs> hey, so no news today because guess what? Are you a red shirt? No. Well, okay. I might be. <laughs> Don't worry, I survived. Trucky humor. <laughs> I am currently traveling, and we're pre-recording this episode just for you guys because you guys are awesome. Yeah. And we don't want to skip an episode. But first off, a big, big, big thank you to everybody who's watching the show each and every week. We make it for you. Yes. And we've got a message from Matthew over who, on Facebook. Who posts on Facebook? Yeah, he posts on Facebook, facebook.com slash tech thing. What's your opinion on power conditioners and backup power supplies like a UPS? I live in a large apartment building and was thinking a power conditioner for my HT or home theater. Would it be a bad idea? Also, a UPS would not be a bad idea as well. The wind is enough to knock out our power power and when they turn on the back of generator it only powers the kitchen. I was looking at solar power generators but they are out of my price range. Thanks, love the show, keep up the great work from Matt. Thank you Matt. Oh my goodness. So at the very least everybody should have, uh, as I reach around, <laughs> some kind of surge protector between your gear and the wall. Absolutely. The surge protector essentially uh, tries to shunt or, or reroute voltage spikes to ground to keep your gear from being killed by the voltage spikes. Mm -hmm. Usually we think of voltage spikes as being an electrical strike from a storm. Right. A friend of mine, um, my friend Josh, I don't know if you ever met him, he had every electrical device in his house, including his stove and refrigerator wiped out when somebody in the training program for our local utility basically uh, ran 400 volts <gasps> through an entire city block. Oh no. Expensive day for the local utility. One of the things you'll notice, one of the best things you can do also is, uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I had all my stuff plugged into, surge protectors, right. but you also want to make sure your cable line ah. is right. If you have a cable modem or if you have, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, DSL, you want to make sure those lines are plugged through the, uh, the, the surge protector because it's kind of funny. You can protect yourself from the electrical sockets and still have your gear wiped out because your cable from the cable huh. company got zapped. So wow. make sure you've got everything wired up. An uninterruptible power supply, um, generally speaking, they are um, temporary. They give you like just enough battery power to gracefully shut down your apps and save your files and shut down your system. There's like a small battery inside a box like this. Now it's really, really crazy. What I didn't realize is the world's largest UPS is 46 megawatts. It's the battery Whoa. electric storage system in Fairbanks, Alaska, and it powers the entire city and nearby rural communities during outages. Huh. Generally speaking, Interesting. Yeah. They probably saved my butt a few times. Probably. <laughs> but it's it's kind of crazy, right? You know, the UPSs outside of Fairbanks, Alaska, or, you know, giant installations still like very heavy. this. Yeah, well, this is like a commercial one for a huge uh, array of servers mm -hmm. or a small business. Generally speaking, UPSs are designed to make sure your PC doesn't get killed by a power outage uh, or a surge. Some of them also do uh, power conditioning. Mm -hmm. Power conditioners are really interesting. They get plugged in between your wall socket and your gear, and it makes sure you have clean 120 volt, uh, 60 hertz AC. You're actually really 120 volts. The basic models they have like you know RFI or EMI filters. Mm -hmm. uh, they correct brownouts, which is low voltages oh, yeah. and over voltages. Um, you know, and I've always been kind of sketchy on them. I asked Robert Hare, my partner in crime on AVXL, if he recommends them, and he said, he says I totally do. Something like APC's Line R 1200 or Trip Lights. LC1200 is a good start. My UPS has an automatic voltage regulation function that smooths out sags and surges. If a home is well wired with ample current available, a conditioner may be less of a concern. In my room, I notice my lamp dim when someone turns on a vacuum or other <laughs> high amperage device. My yeah. PC game console and other cherished gear sits behind the UPS so it keeps these sags surges from reaching them. I like hearing the UPS kick on and off when it's smoothing that out. Robert. Agreed. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I mean, I, where I used to live in New Jersey, the lines were just all being pushed to maximum, especially in the summer. 
there used to be this point, like one o'clock in the morning, when when everybody would be like, I can't sleep. I'm gonna break down. I'm gonna pay Aww. the electric bill. <laughs> and like it would seem like everybody in the surrounding county would turn on their air conditioners, right. and then our house would howl because we had six different machines rendering files, oh, no. like <laughs> on on uninterruptible power supplies. And I'd wake up at like 1:30 in the morning, oh, no. and I'd go and shut the machines down. Now they all do it automatically. <laughs> um, emergency power is kind of a whole different thing. Um, Solar can be cheap if you roll your own system. Like, you know, I have a solar panel and I have, you know, a charging box and I have batteries mm -hmm. up to a point. If you want to power laptops and phones, uh, it's really, really easy. If you want to enjoy HDTV and frozen margaritas, when the power <laughs> is out in your entire neighborhood, it is not so easy. Yeah. Um, you know, emergency power supplies can take so many forms. Uh, mm -hmm. I have two massive 8D batteries that I keep topped off a wow. Honda generator. And of course, there is always the car's alternator, which will keep generating electricity as long as you keep fuel in the tank. I should invest in a generator. Just for the zombie right. apocalypse, because you know it's going to happen eventually. And well, you will need a generator for all your it's, tech. It's not even so much <laughs> a zombie work. apocalypse, but <laughs> we have two big chest freezers, yeah. and if we lose electricity for more than a day oh, and a half, yeah, that's a it turns waste. into two huge chest freezers of mush. Yeah. And I don't want to clean mush out of my chest freezers. <laughs> Neither do I, that'd be kind of gross. I'm just saying. <laughs> This week's Rapid Fire Roundup is three travel accessories Shannon just can't live without, and you might be surprised, but they are tech-related travel accessories. <laughs> are you ready, Ms. Snubs? <laughs> I'm so ready. Go! Woo! Okay, so these are just three different items that I take with me pretty much everywhere, and I can't live without. First off, Anchor makes this five or six port family size desktop USB charger. It powers multiple USB items out of the front with one AC charger that you plug into the back. There's a 60 watt, six port version with Power IQ, which will push whatever your device will take up to 2.4 amps max per port, 12 amps total, which is quite a few and awesome for tablets, mm -hmm. and it costs $35. There's also this Anchor Power Port. 5 port USB charger and this is the one that I actually use and it costs $26 online. These are strictly for charging though. It's very small and durable and it's not so heavy so you can take it with you in your backpack, in your purse, or pretty much wherever you want to fit it. So it's very perfect for traveling especially if you have very limited access to wall power like we do in airports for example. Yes, or the, in Las Vegas where there's like oh, one outlet yeah. for the entire room. And sometimes they're just fake outlets like they don't go anywhere and you plug things <laughs> in and nothing charges. Anyway, <laughs> the Fitbit is my second thing. So this is any Fitbit really you could use. I like these because they track my health, my fitness, my calories, my sleep time, my, my heart monitoring. So I know if I'm falling off my routine band bandwagon while I'm traveling around. I tend to eat a lot whenever I go traveling and I tend to eat uh, lots of junk food, lots of fried <laughs> food. So <laughs> I keep track of it through the Fitbit application. Plus I track my calories burned with my little wristband. The ch one that I have on, this is called the Charge HR. It costs about $142 up on Amazon right now. I've been sporting it for a few months. It's pretty consistent, except when you get in a helicopter and the vibrations think, make it think that you've walked like 20,000 steps in four hours. It's really weird. <laughs> That's a hack. But it's very, very good for heart monitoring as well as tracking your calories eaten in the application and sleep. It's very consistent with tracking my sleep. How does it track your cheeseburger consumption? You have to put it in manually to okay. the application, but as long as you tell it where you got your cheeseburger, if it's like a fast food restaurant mm -hmm. or something like that, it tells you exactly how many calories it, it cost you. And the steps on here will tell you how many calories you burn. So you can basically earn a badge every day depending <laughs> on how many calories you burn. <laughs> Last thing I wanted to share with you guys is a travel converter and adapter. So this is the one that I use. It's called the Travel Smart by Con Air, of all people. <laughs> I guess it's so you can use your hair dryers across the ocean. Makes the converter pretty. changes from 230 bol volts down to 120 and vice versa. And it has all the plugs that I generally need for traveling overseas. The one I have is about 25 bucks and it gets terrible reviews, <laughs> won't lie. But I've had it for about two years and it works just fine for me. I've used it everywhere that I go. Um, no problems as far as all my traveling goes so far. So it's my little lucky thing. I will say it like it is one of those things that just sounds like it's about to explode. It does. <laughs> it does. It sounds terrible, but it works great. I've had no problems with it whatsoever. It's a power so charger. Weird. It's a musical instrument. <laughs>
<laughs> of course, I want to know what your picks are. If you guys have a different uh, adapter and converter that I should look into, since this one is old, <laughs> let me know. Tech thing, uh, ask at techthing.com. <laughs> tech thing. Just at tech thing on Twitter. <laughs> Time for our HostGator Disruptive Tech of the Week. Let's talk about Ethernet, which is the new orange as far as I'm concerned. Bradley <laughs> has a great... <laughs> Are you mocking my love of Netflix? I might be. My wife loves that series. <laughs> hey, we got an email from Bradley who wrote in, I've been toying with the idea of networking my home. I've gone through routers, firmware, gargoyle was great, and range extenders, but in the end, I just prefer an Ethernet connection. I want to run a line or two to each of my rooms throughout the house, as well as to several WAPs, maybe with power over Ethernet. Mm -hmm. I've read good and bad about CCA Ethernet, Cat 5E versus Cat 6E, yes or no to PoE, and in the end, I'm still feeling like Jon Snow. Aww. Good reference, Bradley. You know right. nothing, John. <laughs> Bradley. Bradley. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. I run Ethernet to everything I can. It just works even when my neighbors start experimenting with weird power boosting stupidity what? on their routers. I had a neighbor <laughs> who basically blew out the entire neighborhood once oh, because no. I don't know what they were using, but it was it was kind of like this amazing spike. That's amazing. And it was just like, you know, oddly enough, I knew who it was. It was like, knock, knock, knock. Quit it. And they were like, <laughs> sorry. Cat 6E is good enough for me, though Cat 7, which adds additional shielding, might be considerably more future-proof. Um, run copper, not copper over aluminum, if you have mm. a choice. Your house isn't that big. You're not saving that much money. I think power uh, over Ethernet, PoE, is fine if you don't try to run 80,000 devices on the network. <laughs> Professionals use it all the time. Mm -hmm. Your idea of running everything to a patch panel on a rack mount in the basement, then to a switch, is ideal. It doesn't get any better than that. Also. You don't know nothing, Jon Snow. You're just up to your eyeballs with internet, which contains every single opinion. <laughs> Most true. of them are disagreeing. <laughs> and look, I know pulling cable is old school, but frankly, tech that works is a lot more disruptive than tech that doesn't. Yes. By the way, don't use staples. They tend to mash the cable across power lines at 90 degree angles and try to keep your ethernet at least 18 inches away from power lines. Although uh, 6E and 7 should not be particularly subject to leaks across them. I mean, you know, it's, it's a little like, you know, you can get very, very anal about routing right. ethernet, which right. is very, very overkill um, <laughs> in most cases, not always. So if you need a better place to host your website, if you're firing up a new business, our sponsor, HostGator.com, has a deal for you because they love you. Use the coupon code TECHTHING, you'll get 30% off any new hosting package, and you'll help support the show. Thank you. I want to make all the websites. I'm just trying to make one, maybe two. <laughs> and then we'll figure out what comes next. Okay. Okay. Since we are talking about copper, Peter has a useful tip that he sent after watching her speed round on setting up home theater speakers. Peter's got the tip. Patrick, do not put bare wire in a crawl space. Put it in a PVC conduit. One, it will be more secure. Two, if you need to add more cable, then it will be easier to fish with PVC conduit. And three, face it, conduit is just cool. Yes, I just said so. So it is. <laughs> End of discussion. PVC is what I used when I cabled. No, not wired. That's for power. My house last year and the second, third, fourth, etc cables were much easier to fish. Also, I, I used two fish tapes so I could pull it back and go again and again and again and again and again from Peter. <laughs> oh my goodness. This is a great idea. If you're not sure what Peter's talking about, um, the idea of, and we've had people suggest this before, take a look at my screen here. That pipe you see sticking out of the floor, this is from the darkhearseobservatory.com or dark Amazing. horse, not hearse. Essentially, you're talking about running big plastic tubes through which you can pull your cables. Oh, that's so cool. Right, so it, literally the whole idea is that if you have to pull, if later on the specs change, you need mm -hmm. to pull a new cable, it's really, really easy because pulling cables through two by fours is a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Before you install anything in the walls of your house, uh, make sure you call the housing, or I should say the, the authority having jurisdiction. Yeah. Uh, that's the Landlord. inspectors. Well, no, you don't, yeah, you talk to your landlord. If you, okay, if you <laughs> rent your house, <laughs> talk, talk to your to landlord. Your, what she said. <laughs> If you own your house, talk to the authority having juris jurisdiction, which is essentially who whoever issues permits for your area yeah. uh, to find out what is legit. Generally speaking, as long as you're not running cable through ducts or plenums uh, or on a drop ceiling, uh, you can get away with pretty much anything. Don't do something and then blame me. Talk to your local building <laughs> inspectors first. Please. Yeah. Disclaimer, don't blame us. <laughs> well, no, but it's like, I don't want to get like 32,000 emails from you yeah, like, you know, yeah. it is irresponsible to just people can safely pull Ethernet cable through the call space underneath their, you know what I mean? Like, I get it. <laughs> Talk to the authority 
having <laughs> jurisdiction. Like he said. Thank you. <laughs> we got another email from JY who said, Hi, Patrick and Shannon. I have an external Western Digital 1 terabyte hard drive, and I want to set a password on a folder before opening up. Let us know. Love the show. Thanks. From JY in LA. So we're encrypting a folder. We are encrypting folders. Encrypt all the things, as they say. Now, there is Woo! plenty. There are a lot of third-party services that will do this, uh, lots and lots of different software. For example, there is one called Folder Lock that you might want to look at. This one is free. It's available for Windows 7, 8, and XP as well. Uh, they don't have one for Windows 10 yet, but I'm pretty sure they will. Now, Windows doesn't make it really easy just to password protect one folder all by itself, <laughs> but there is kind of a work around to do it, you can use a batch script to hide your folder with a password. And basically, you just follow the directions that have been listed out over at HowToGeek. Luckily, he wrote these out really, really easy to use. How to create a password protected folder without any extra software. Obviously, this can be exploited easily if somebody understands how to edit a .bat or a batch script and can figure out how to unhide that folder so right. that they can get back into it. But for general use case scenarios, you probably won't need to worry about somebody figuring that out, and mm -hmm. you could use this scenario, this feature. Otherwise, use a third-party software to lock it up. Encrypt it. That is how you do the thing. Encrypt all the things. Well, it's lab. Like I, somebody, you know, they pulled a drive out of a machine and put it into another machine, yeah. and they were shocked that they could read all of the files on the hard drive. And I was like, Well, well yeah. If you don't <laughs> encrypt them, everybody gets to look at them if they can get their grubby little mitts in your hard drive. Oh man. oh, man. I miss TrueCrypt. <laughs> well, TrueCrypt actually has been gone through. They've basically been going through it. And Did they, they go through their audit? The, the audit so far is clean. Okay. That's good. The audit looks good. All right. That's really good. If you want us to talk about encrypting drives. Yes. If you Let want us, us know. Yeah. There's some interesting stuff going on. Also, we have a conversation with the creators of PFSense coming up in the Ooh. near future. If you're looking to build your own super router. And if you're a fan of TechThing, make sure you subscribe at techthing.com on iTunes or YouTube.com slash techthing. Then make sure you get each and every episode. And if you want to take it to the next level, consider contributing to the show at patreon.com slash techthing. You can donate however much you want every episode and every little bit counts. And you'll get our new monthly build video for Patreon. That's patreon.com slash tech thing. Woohoo! And of course, if you can't donate, no worries. Please take the time to send us questions, send us your tips, to share the show with your friends and family. Just giving our video a thumbs up over on YouTube, or you want to like our Facebook page where we've been posting a bunch of news articles. All that stuff really helps. And thank you so, so much for supporting the show. And remember, once in a while, I know we say this during every single episode at the end, <laughs> put Do something away along. the screen, you know, step away. Put down your phone, close your laptop, do something analog, like Patrick's recommendation of tide pooling. What is tide pooling? Okay, so in the Pacific Ocean, when the tide goes down, there are often pockets where uh, oh. seawater and sea creatures are trapped. So you can walk like up. Like urchins. Urchins, crabs, sea anemones, fish. Mm. Yummy. Um, it's, uh, I'm not a big <laughs> fan of Unami, but it is fun to look at them in the little pools, and kids love it. That is really it. cool. There's actually an amazing place to do it just south of San Francisco. Ooh. We should put together places, a list of things to do in San Francisco. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You. <laughs> and you should send us lists of things that you love to do that are analog, and we'll share them with everybody on the show. For show. For show. I'm Barry Norton. I'm Shannon Morse. We'll see you next week on Tech Fest. I'll take totally random weirdness for a thousand, Alex. The answer is coconut oil. Things I don't want rubbed on my cat. Bing. <laughs> That's our wipe. What are you videotaping? Oh, you're videotaping the Patriots. I feel like the NSA. No way. That's if I'm listening to your conversations. <laughs> That's horrible. Don't notice it so far. I loaded on your phone, Shannon. What? Nothing. Nobody touches my phone. Yeah, I heard you that. You can't get into my phone. <laughs> it's encrypted. Lies. And the lying liars who tell them. You can't touch my laptop. It's encrypted. I touched it. <laughs> you can't touch my GPS. It's encrypted. Well, it's not here. <laughs> it's probably a more effective deterrent. Yeah, I just never got into urchin sushi. Mm. Eel skin I'm great with, tuna, all sorts of stuff. No, just never got into urchin. <laughs> <laughs>
That's the sound of Shannon eating your spleen. <laughs> it's generally the last thing you hear before she crushes your skull with a giant rock. <laughs> Apparently spleen only tastes really good if you eat it while the victim is still alive. That's the most disgusting noise ever. 